Hi everyone. This is Miriam Naime from the Alan Turing Institute and Newcastle University. Welcome to the Smart Charging Webinar. The aim of the Smart Charging Webinar is to know who is doing what on Smart Charging. We've had a couple of webinars already. We covered the uh, communication protocols for vehicle grid integration, and we also uh, spoke about national and regional plans for rolling out um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. You can find the slides on the webinar landing page, and you can also find all the videos on a YouTube playlist if you search for the Smart Charging webinar. Today's talk is on IEEE 2030.5. Uh, it would be good today to hear from uh, Gordon, our speaker, where IEEE 2030.5 would, would fit in this um, EV ecosystem uh, graph that we see. Does it fit in the front-end communication between the electric vehicle and the charger, or an end between the charger and a third-party operator? We recently published a paper uh, with uh, a colleague from DTU on this topic, and you can find it open access on the link uh, provided on this slide. Uh, some of the insights our speakers in this webinar sh they shared, we have included them in this review paper. In the paper, you can also find um, a graph that uh, summarizes the different charging options in a concise way. Uh, the Smart Charging Webinar is an activity of um, uh, the Alan Turing Institute and the Supergen Energy Networks. The Alan Turing Institute is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial in intelligence. And uh, myself and my team at the Turing, we are specifically looking at vehicle grid integration. Uh, Supergen is doing its first conference in London on the 20, uh, 29th and 30th of April, and it's free uh, and currently open for registration. Uh, some of our confirmed speakers include Charles Tsai, who's the Chief Executive Officer and Director of Power Assets Holding. Uh, power Assets Holding is a global uh, investor in power and utility related businesses. For example, they, share, they hold a 40% share in UK power networks in the UK and also around 40% in Northern Gas Network. Okay, today's speaker is Gordon Loom who's the CTO, C CTO of q system which is a software company providing smart energy communication solutions. Gordon is involved in 20, at IEEE 2030.5, but also he's a member of many cybersecurity work groups. And I highlighted the cybersecurity aspect because it is something we're looking at specifically right now in the UK, the cybersecurity and privacy issues from connected infrastructure. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the presentation to Gordon. Okay, let me uh, start sharing my screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, okay. we can see it and we can hear you. Okay, all right, let's and get I, started. I wanted to remind the participants that uh, they can feel free to include questions in the text uh, box of Zoom and uh, I'll read them out for you uh, at the end. Okay, uh, with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, as Miriam has mentioned, this is the seminar on uh, IEEE 2030.5. Um, here is a brief outline of my talk today. I'll go over a brief history and purpose of the protocol, uh, the key components of the protocol, including its key features, so key concepts, uh, some of the smart energy functions that it supports, and uh, the cybersecurity topic, which seems to be very important to people of late. Uh, after that, I will go into a couple of use cases for IEEE 2030.5. The first is the EV charging use case, and the second is a DER distributed energy resource use case. 
So the first uh, major topic is the uh, uh, overview of the protocol itself. So what is IEEE 2030.5? In a nutshell, it's an open international standard for smart energy communications that was primarily geared for home area network devices. As this diagram shows, um, we have an EMS um, system that's communicating with many different uh, smart energy devices in the home, including uh, the smart meter, smart thermostat, et cetera. So it was originally designed for uh, in-home communications of smart energy devices. But although it was designed for in-home use, most of the recent activity and interest has actually been on communications of in-home devices with servers on the internet. Uh, specifically, uh, for example, um, cloud servers that are controlling uh, electric vehicle charging and, and EVSC operations. Um, for a brief history of the 2030.5 protocol, 2030.5 actually began life in the 2010 timeframe as Smart Energy Profile 2.0, also known as SEP2 under the governance of the Zigbee Alliance. There was an existing protocol called uh, SEP1 or SEP1, which was a proprietary protocol running on top of IEEE uh, 208.15.4, uh, um, excuse me, 802.15.4, which is essentially Zigbee. Uh, it was designed to address utility-centric functions like metering, demand response, pricing, and other related services. One of the goals of SEP2 was to expand on uh, the uses of SEP1, but also create a protocol that was more MACFI agnostic, that it could be run on many, many different physical layers, not just uh, the Zigbee physical layer. Um, since SEP2 was no longer being tied to Zigbee, it made sense that the governance of the protocol would be moved out, out of the Zigbee Alliance into a more general uh, platform. And so the CSEP organization was formed. CSEP stands for the Consortium for SEP2 Interoperability, and it consisted of the Wi-Fi Alliance, the Zigbee Alliance, the Home Plug Alliance, and the Bluetooth SIG. So in 2013, the CSEP organization uh, formally ratified and published the SEP 2.0 specification. Uh, shortly after that, uh, governance of the standard was turned over to IEEE and it became IEEE 2030.5. Uh, one of the reasons why it was turned over was um, to be able to promote it as an international standard. So in 2014, uh, SEP 2.0 became IEEE 2030.5, and the term SEP2, even though it's easier to say and easier to write, has now been um, deprecated in favor of using um, IEEE 2030.5 to re refer to the protocol. Uh, since then, there has been a lot of activity in the DER distributed energy resource space. So um, in the years leading up to 2018, a lot of work was done to add uh, DER support, specifically support that included um, total support of the IEEE 1547 standard, which defined the interconnection and interoperability of distributed energy resources. So one of the goals of the 2018 update of the standard was to completely support the DER use case as defined in IEEE 1547. Since 2018, um, there's still work being done by the Standards Committee. Um, we are now working on uh, um, addressing uh, current topics that are, that are uh, relevant in the marketplace. Uh, we're looking at advanced security models. We're looking at um, additions to DER on V2G. And so even though the, the standard was published in 2018, there's still a lot of activity in order to keep the standard um, uh, fresh and meeting the desires of the marketplace. Okay, um, so what are the uh, goals of the 2030.5 standard? 
Um, this slide lists uh, a number of them. Um, it was uh, designed to provide an, an application layer support for many smart energy functions, including demand response, load control, distributed energy resources, pricing, metering, and other smart energy functions. It was also uh, designed for zero configuration. Um, there's a desire for devices to automatically come up and discover uh, resources and servers on their local network and to inter uh, autonomously interact and operate uh, with them without any user intervention. Another goal was for internetworking. Um, even though the uh, protocol was primarily designed to work inside the home, um, uh, one of the goals was to be able to work uh, with it even outside the home over the wide area internet. So um, this was uh, one of the uh, key features to allow it to work with like cloud servers and utility servers. Another goal was to provide a very, very robust security uh, model for this protocol. Um, high security um, was a design goal from the very, very beginning. It wasn't uh, a bolted on after the fact. Other design goals include the, build, the ability to run the device, uh, run the protocol uh, using very, very low resources, low resource devices, including um, low resource RAM, uh, flash, and MIPS. And to be able to run in low uh, bandwidth environments um, like the Zigbee uh, physical layer network. Um, and another primary goal was to uh, use open standards to define this protocol instead of inventing another proprietary standard. So how were these goals achieved? Uh, the next co couple of slides will go into a brief uh, description of how uh, 23RF5 uh, achieved or tried to achieve those goals uh, presented in the previous slide. Uh, the first goal was zero configuration. And, it, and in order to achieve zero configuration, 23RF5 adopted the MDNS DNS SD uh, protocol. MDNS stands for multicast DNS. It's a method for a device to use multicast to auto discover uh, um, addresses of hosts in the home and these uh, resources that those hosts um, are, are able to uh, provide. Um, in the wide area network, um, you can use standard DNS instead of MDNS. And if people are not familiar with MDNS or DNS SD, this is the exact same protocol that Apple devices used in order to discover other Apple devices and other um, services or devices like printers. So we are trying to reuse uh, existing uh, uh, well, uh, well used and, and well baked st uh, standards for, for our protocol. Um, the goal of internet working uh, basically meant that we wanted the protocol to be IP based. Uh, specifically, we wanted to be uh, use all of the modern, you know, IP uh, techniques uh, used in the web, and so the protocol uses HTTP over TCP. Specifically, it uses a RESTful HTTP model for interaction, and it uses a uh, specific defined XML schema to to describe the resources that are available for manipulation using this model. Uh, as far as robust security, um, the protocol specifies the use of TLS 1.2 uh, with a very, very strong cipher suite. And I will go into the details of this uh, later on in this presentation. As far as low resource support, uh, the, the, uh, since the protocol had its uh, origins, in the Zigbee Alliance, uh, it was designed to run on Zigbee class devices. Uh, these uh, devices usually had very, very low resources on the order of maybe uh, hundreds of kilobytes of RAM and flash and uh, uh, low power MIPS uh, on the class of, uh, of ARM thumb or, or uh, M, M3 type class devices. Um, in order to also uh, facilitate low resource uh, operation, the REST model was used for uh, simplicity of operation. 
as far as low bandwidth uh, support, um, the protocol supports both uh, direct XML payloads and also to compress the version of XML called EXI to reduce the uh, packet size. EXI does a very, very good job of payload compression. Uh, some of the tests that I've made using uh, comparing uh, EXI to XML shows uh, roughly you know, eight to one or nine to one reduction in the packet size, excuse me, on the payload size of the packet. Uh, another uh, aspect that will help reduce bandwidth is that even though the uh, 23.5 is primarily a polling protocol, it does have a mechanism to push data to a device uh, in order to reduce polling overhead of resources that are constantly being, being accessed. Uh, as far as um, uh, open standards and interoperability, um, one of the design goals was to use open standards and use uh, um, protocols and standards that are widely used and available and has proven the test of time. And so the protocol is modeled after a, uh, a standard web services paradigm. Um, and it uses uh, standard web services protocols like TCP, uh, TCP IP, HTTP, HTTPS. It uses a RESTful uh, interaction model. And it uses a schema that is defined, uh, that is based on the IEC 61968 SIM, which is essentially the dictionary that all smart energy you know, devices use. Um, regarding the, the web aspect of it, um, the interactions between uh, 23.5 devices look very, very much like uh, what uh, the interaction between a web browser and a web server. And so developers can use the same tools that they use to develop uh, web services. At, uh, they could use those tools to develop the 23.5 protocol. So this promotes interoperability. It promotes um, uh, developers coming up to speed very quickly on uh, developing services using this protocol. This slide shows where the 23.5 protocol resides in the OSI uh, model layer. Um, it's primarily an application layer protocol uh, sitting on top of uh, the lower layer, you know, transport and network and uh, physical layers. Um, it delves slightly into the presentation layer in that it defines HTTPS operation and MDNS operation. Uh, of note, since it sits very high up on the stack, it is essentially uh, IP agnostic and physical layer agnostic. So if you heard me use the term REST uh, earlier, uh, so what exactly is REST? Uh, REST stands for representation state transfer. And is, it is an architectural style for implementing web services in a stateless manner. And uh, being stateless, it promotes simplicity and interoperability. Uh, REST also implies certain, certain um, features that the 23.5 protocol has. Uh, for example, REST uh, implies the use of a client server architecture where the server hosts resources and clients manipulate resources on servers. Uh, a server resource can be thought of any object that has an address, uh, in this case, a URL. Um, clients interact with servers basically by um, performing four, object, four operations on those resources at those URLs. And those uh, op uh, operations are simply get, put, post, and delete. Get is used to read uh, the resource Put and post are used to create and modify resources, and delete is used to uh, remove a resource. So all operations on this uh, on on the protocol are, are done through just these uh, four uh, commands. Uh, another uh, feature of REST is that all of the activity is initiated on the client side. So the server is just sits there hosting resources, waiting for clients to uh, read and manipulate 
those resources. Um, this protocol involves clients manipulating resources. One of the one type of resource that is used in time related functions is the event resource. So what is an event? An event is essentially a control resource that can be scheduled. So it has a time, a start time, and has a duration, uh, both of which can be randomized. So if there's an application where you do not want every device to start at exactly the same time or to, uh, uh, or to occur for the exact same duration, uh, both of the start time and duration can be randomized. Only a subset of the functions that are described in 23.5 are time-based and therefore have events, but some of the most important functions do, and they include demand response load control, uh, DER, which stands for uh, distributed energy resources, like uh, solar systems and uh, battery systems, uh, the pricing uh, functions where the price of energy can change uh, based on the time of day, uh, messaging, uh, and flow reservation. Uh, flow reservation is a function that I'll, I will describe in further detail later, but it is essentially a mechanism for uh, electric vehicles and uh, servers to dynamically uh, uh, schedule uh, charging and discharging. Um, events are also governed by a rich set of defined event rules. So events can be scheduled, uh, scheduled events can be canceled, uh, events can possibly overlap, one event can possibly supersede another event, um, events can uh, operate simultaneously uh, as independent events or possibly uh, not simultaneously in, in the sense that it can be superseded by other events. And there's a concept of a default event uh, that, can, uh, that, are, that is in effect if there are no other active events uh, in, in process. So there's a, a rich uh, support for uh, events and events play a very key role in the protocol. Another important resource in the in 23.5 protocol is the concept of an end device. Uh, so what is an end device? An end device is simply a client device that is uh, recognized by the server. Uh, end device resources uh, allow the server to manage individual clients. So this means that a server can send uh, individual controls directed at that one particular client device, and it can receive status and metrology information from that specific client device. The server represents a client device by creating an end device instance in its uh, end device instance list. So when a client comes up and discovers the end device uh, uh, instance list, it can find its end device resource and discover uh, what information the server has assigned to it. Um, it can then also post its status information to the server to inform the server of its current status. Uh, one important part of the end device instance is the uh, function set assignments for that end device resource. So what is the function set assignment that I just mentioned? Well, function set assignment is basically uh, uh, the term used for grouping in 23.5. A client device or an end device can be assigned to one or more groups uh, through the function set assignments list that in the device's end device instance. And uh, being assigned to these groups, a server can target controls specific to those devices that belong to those specific groups. Uh, a control sent to a group causes all members of that group to execute that same control. Clients can uh, be assigned to one or more groups and the servers can dynamically change a client's uh, device assignment. 
clients are not do not uh, groups do not need to be statically defined a priori. They can come and go as needed by the server, and clients will track which groups dynamically track which which groups uh, they belong to. And this is one of the key features that uh, it was used by the DER use case in California. So in California, um, there's something called Rule 21, which defines uh, the rules for con uh, the requirements for interconnecting a smart energy, uh, DER energy device like an inverter uh, to the grid in California. And the Rule 21 uh, requirements require uh, communications and uh, certain other abilities as well. One of it, one of which was uh, the ability to tar target controls to specific inverters belonging to specific groups. And in California, they de decided to group um, devices based on their location in the electric grid topology. So in this diagram, which comes from the uh, user's guide for Rule 21, um, shows an inverter, inverter A, uh, listed uh, near the bottom, that belongs to all those oval nodes uh, above it. Each of those oval nodes represents a group. And those nodes uh, represent a group based on where they sit in the electric grid hierarchy. So the inverter A connects to a service point, uh, which in turn connects to its transformer, which in turn connects to a segment and a feeder all the way up into a group that represents the entire system. So the utility has the ability to target a control. For example, it could send a control to a specific transformer and all of the DER devices connected to that transformer will execute that control. Um, not only can uh, they target controls to a specific transformer, but the grouping and uh, the protocol allows uh, the utility to define the priority of certain groups. So if there are conflicting controls uh, that are targeted to uh, two, two groups that the uh, inverter belongs to, there is a priority mechanism to define which control actually will take precedence. Um, in California, I mentioned that they, they decided to use uh, topology as the grouping mechanism, but the protocol in, uh, is more generic than that. It allows grouping based on other criteria, um, not just um, uh, topological criteria. Um, the inverter can belong also belong to a group representing a certain market uh, program. It could also belong to a group that represents a certain class of inverter or a uh, particular manufacturer of inverter. So even though uh, California decide to uh, limit its grouping to topology, the protocol itself has no such limits. You could define groups in any uh, way you see fit. Uh, another aspect of uh, 23 out of 5 is how it organizes its resources. And the, the way that it organizes its resources is to uh, organize them in what's called function sets. So a function set is a common set of resources that serve a particular purpose. Examples of function sets are, are shown in the, uh, the second major bullet. They include DRLC, um, distributed energy resources, pricing, metering, flow reservation, and some basic uh, uh, um, system operation uh, resources. So a client uh, server hosts one or more function sets based on the type of services it provides, and the client will uh, interact with only a subset of resources, those resources, those function sets that it uh, decides to implement. The two highlighted function sets, the, the DER function set and the flow reservation function set. I'll uh, describe more in the next couple of slides because I think these are the ones the most relevant to the uh, listeners of this webinar. So what is the DER function set? Um, the primary purpose of the DER function set was to be able to implement all of the controls and all of the information that is required by IEEE 1547. 
And those controls can be um, categorized into three major um, uh, categories. The first are safety related controls. So these are controls that affect um, the, the safe operation of like a solar inverter uh, in, a, in presence of like a grid anomaly. So they define uh, high and low voltage ride throughs and high and low voltage, um, uh, high and low frequency ride throughs. And these basically uh, tell the uh, inverter how to operate in the presence of a major, major changes, uh, major anomalies in the electric grid. So the voltage uh, gets too high, should the device continue to operate or should it disconnect? The frequency gets too high or too, or too low, should it continue to operate or should it continue to, uh, or should it, should it disconnect? And not only uh, is the uh, level of um, anomaly considered, but also the duration. And so these curves describe the operation of the inverters in those scenarios. The next major category of DER are the direct control functions. And these are, are, are controls that directly affect the operation of the uh, inverter itself. So, uh, these controls include the ability to uh, connect and disconnect the inverter from the grid, uh, to limit its real power output, uh, to set uh, a real power set point. Um, this is mainly uh, geared toward battery systems, uh, to set its reactive power uh, set point, whether or not to provide reactive power or consume reactive power, and also to set the, the power factor. Um, for an inverter. The third class of uh, controls are the grid stability controls. These involve controls that tell how the inverter should behave in the presence of small anomalies on, uh, on the grid. For example, with the volt var curve, it instructs the inverter how to vary its uh, reactive power uh, output or consumption based on what is based on the measured voltage of the grid. Similarly, for uh, the volt-watt curve, it instructs the, how, the inverter how to uh, reduce its power output, real power output, based on the measured uh, grid voltage. Uh, same thing for frequency. Uh, it'll adjust the uh, real power output based on uh, frequency anomalies. Here is a um, uh, pictorial diagram of uh, some of the resources in the DER function set. On the left-hand side uh, shows the UML model of the, uh, the control aspects of the DER function set. And on the right-hand side um, is, a, is a look at what the XML payload looks like. So this is what's actually been tra being transmitted over the air between a client and the server. And the, uh, Information highlighted in blue on the right-hand side uh, shows uh, what a DER control looks like. It has some metadata like its creation time, its event status, et cetera, but it also has um, uh, information like when it should uh, take place. That's the start uh, tag there. How long should this control be active? That's the duration tag in the interval um, resource. And what type of control it is. Uh, the op mod max lim w uh, is a control that uh, defines the maximum limit of the inverter and the value of 5,000, the units are in 0.1% uh, uh, of a nameplate. So 5,000 represents uh, a max limit of 50% uh, of the nameplate rating of the inverter. Uh, the next function set I would like to highlight is the flow reservation function set. So flow reservation is used to optimize scheduling of charging and discharging events, uh, primarily directed at electric vehicles, but it also can be used for battery systems as well. And in, in this function set, a client device uh, requests energy from the server and it tells the server how much energy it needs, uh, its maximum rate of delivery, essentially the power that, the maximum power that it can uh, uh, consume, and the interval 
uh, over which uh, the total energy should be uh, delivered. So for example, if I have an electric vehicle, um, I can use the flow uh, reservation function set to request, um, let's say 20 kilowatt hours of energy uh, delivered uh, with a maximum power level of six kilowatts and over an eight hour time period between uh, midnight and 8 a.m. Uh, tonight. And with that request, the server creates a series of flow responses. Each of those flow responses define the amount of energy and power and duration that the electric vehicle can uh, pull uh, for that uh, response. And um, the, the server has the freedom of changing uh, the duration of uh, the response and the uh, level of charging and the total energy of the response. So it doesn't have to always give uh, the, the electric vehicle the same amount of power uh, over uh, the entire time period. It could break them up into a series of smaller events that allow it to better schedule uh, and optimize charging. So in the diagram below, it shows that the, the server has decided to fulfill the client's request by breaking up charging into three discrete intervals um, that are not uh, continuous and may not over uh, uh, and uh, may not represent the same level of charging. But at the end of the day, the electric vehicle will receive the total amount of uh, uh, energy that it had requested. So this diagram shows the typical um, interaction between a client device and a server device. Before I mentioned uh, the, all the resources and functions that are available, but how does a client and server device interact with each other uh, when it starts up? This diagram tries to show you what typically happens when a, a client first interacts with a server. So when a client uh, comes up, uh, it goes through what's called the discovery phase. It uh, performs uh, MDNS or DNS in order to find the servers on the internet or the local area network. Once it finds the servers, then it goes and queries the servers to try to see what type of resources the server hosts. Once it gets that information, it tries to see if the client uh, is uh, properly registered on that server. And it does that by uh, trying to find its end device instance on that server. Uh, once it's uh, verified that it has been properly registered on that server, the client will then go and obtain its group assignments and uh, its FSAs that I had described earlier. Once it has figured out what uh, groups it belongs to, it needs to uh, periodically monitor those groups in order to figure out if there are any outstanding controls for it. So it goes into the steady state operation where it's periodically polling for controls. It also periodically sends its current status and also sends uh, any metrology data associated with uh, the device. So this is a typical you know, a usage pattern or interaction pattern between a client and server using 2030.5. So um, some final thoughts on uh, this protocol in general. Um, 2030.5 is not a SCADA protocol. It is not really designed for uh, real-time direct control of devices. Although uh, many utilities and stakeholders are actually using this for SCADA-like services. Um, the time frame of 23.5 is on the order of you know, seconds to tens of seconds or greater. So it is not designed for sub-second controls. Um, I would suggest that typical usage is on the order of minutes uh, to hours. Um, controls are typically not uh, scheduled on a second by second basis, but more likely on a minute basis or larger. Um, also, um, 2030.5 is not a pure command pr uh, protocol or a pure information protocol. Um, certain protocols like OpenADR is an information protocol where it uh, provides information 
to a device and allows the, uh, the device to make an informed choice. It does not uh, directly control the operation of the device, uh, but provides information for the device to make proper decisions. Um, 2305 also supports that type of model, in particular, the DERLC model function set of 2305 is, uses that information type paradigm similar to OpenADR. Um, but for the uh, uh, DER function set, the protocol acts more like a command and control protocol, similar to Modbus or DMP3. So 23 i5 is not purely one or the other, it's actually a hybrid depending on the function sets that are used. I mentioned that 23i5 is uh, a REST protocol, but is not purely a REST pro protocol. Um, in REST, uh, the client uh, does all of the action. It, uh, it pulls for uh, resources on the servers. A server is just sit back and uh, respond to polls and requests from the clients. Um, but 23i5 is not purely REST in the sense that there is a mechanism for a server to push information uh, to a client device instead of waiting for the client device to pull for that information. And so it has this uh, more efficient uh, push mechanism for those cases where uh, polling ho overhead is, is a, of a concern. So that um, concludes the general overview of the uh, 23i5 protocol. Now I would like to address some of the uh, security aspects of the protocol. Um, I'll try to uh, go through this quickly since I think I'm already uh, uh, short on time. Um, 23i5 uh, was designed from the very beginning uh, to be secure. And one of the design goals was to make sure that it complies with NSA Suite B recommendations and requirements at the secret level. NSA Suite B is essentially the, the uh, requirements that government uh, computer systems uh, need to uh, maintain in order to be used by the government at various levels of security like secret and, and top secret. Um, one of the uh, consequences of Suite B recommendations is that it uses elliptic curves for its public key algorithm instead of RSA, both from a, uh, uh, the belief that uh, elliptic curves are more secure than RSA and that uh, uh, elliptic curves are more efficient in, in the sense that the, the key size for equivalent security is much less for elliptic curves than RSA. Um, another aspect of Suite B is that the uh, the, um, that the Cypher Suite that's used must uh, adhere to perfect forward secrecy. Uh, what this means is that um, a, if you compromise the key for the current session, that still uh, makes uh, uh, communications that were used in previous sections uh, secure. So um, this is a very Im important feature for security and most uh, modern um, Cypher suites uh, have this property. Another property of uh, Suite B is the use of uh, what's called AEAD um, protocols. Um, AEAD means uh, that uh, they use a specific algorithm that, that combines both encryption and message authentication in a single operation. Um, and the thought is, or the current thought is that um, combining these two operations into a single algorithm makes uh, them more secure than having them separate. And, uh, and the final consequence of C, uh, Suite B at the secret level is that um, the Cypher Suite uh, basically has to provide at least 128 bits of security. With that in mind, uh, 23rd of dot five sh uh, chose the Cypher Suite shown uh, below. Um, this Cypher Suite is the one and only Cypher Suite that is specified, and it was a conscious decision to only use one Cypher Suite. And the reason to do that was to promote interoperability. The more Cypher Suites you have, the more chance for uh, two devices to not be able to communicate with each other. And so uh, there was a goal to just um, standardize on a single, very secure Cypher Suite. And the one listed was the one that was chosen. 
Um, some of the properties I already, uh, of the Cypher Suite I already uh, alluded to in the previous slide. Um, the Cypher Suite uses uh, the P256 ECC curve. This is a very, very standard curve that is, uh, that has many software and hardware implementations out in the field. So it can be implemented very, very efficiently even on uh, highly constrained devices like Zigbee devices. It uses standard AES-128 and, and SHA-256. It uses the Diffie Helmet ephemeral uh, version of uh, the key exchange in order to implement the for perfect forward secrecy property that I mentioned earlier. And it uses the CCM as the AEAD algorithm to combine both encryption and authentication. As far as the performance of this Cypher suite, as I mentioned earlier, it provides 128 bits of security, which comply, which uh, equates to NSA uh, suite B at the secret level. Um, it actually provides better security than what is used uh, to secure financial transactions. So the security that's used in order to like uh, do credit card purchases and ATM purchases uh, are use what's called a PCI 2.0 specification. And that, specific that specification only requires that communications be secured uh, with 112 bits of security. So the 128 bits of security used by 235 exceeds what's required for tr financial transactions. Also, um, all of the components of the uh, Cypher Suite comply with TLS version 1.3. Um, as many of you may know, TLS 1.3 has recent been, recently been ratified as an RFC, and this is a uh, successor to what's currently used, TLS 1.2. Um, TLS 1.3 basically removes all the insecure and legacy uh, Cypher Suites and algorithms uh, in favor of only including very, very strong uh, algorithms and components. And all the components that are used in the Cypher Suite that 2030.5 uses is compliant with TLS version 1.3. And the final thing is that all of the uh, algorithms, both the uh, elliptic curve and the AES algorithm uh, that's used, um, there are no known weakness, weaknesses of, uh, to those algorithms at this time. And we believe that uh, this Cypher Suite would, is good for the next five to 10 years of operation. I think um, I've already alluded to uh, the strength of the Cypher Suite in the previous slide, but this graph shows uh, uh, how this uh, Cypher Suite compares uh, with uh, different criteria. The two boxes in green are what's used in the 2305 Cypher Suite, and you can see that it complies with both PCI 2.0 specifications and as well as NSA Suite B specifications. Um, another aspect of cybersecurity uh, is access control. And in 2305, uh, access control is purely based on identity. So um, 2305 devices can access uh, resources on servers uh, purely based on who they are um, and not, not what role, role they play. And in order to do that, um, identity is defined by the certificate that a client uh, possesses. So a client would uh, send a certificate to the server during its TLX during its TLX, TLS exchange, and the server can verify the valid, validity of the identity and the, and the authentication of the identity at, at that time. Um, servers uh, use that, that identity to uh, determine the access control. So in theory, every resource that a server hosts has an access control list based on the certificate identity. Um, in theory, every, resources, every resource can have a different access control list, but in practice, uh, most servers will limit uh, access or control access on a function set by function set basis or by a server to server basis. <laughs> Since um, identity plays a key role in the access control of the protocol, 
um, I think the, um, some of the uh, properties of certificates are important to understand. Um, it is assumed that every 23 out of 5 communication, communicating device has a device certificate. And, nice, and that device certificate is installed in that device at manufacturer time. And that certificate uh, exists for the duration of, uh, for the lifetime of that device. So uh, it's a permanent uh, identity for that device. What that means is that the certificate acts more like a birth certificate instead of a driver's license. Um, so the certificate does not expire and a certificate cannot be revoked. Um, so there, that means that there is no such thing as uh, certificate revocation lists for these certificates and that the online certificate status protocol, OCSP, is not used to revoke these certificates. So essentially, these certificates are, uh, are permanent. And there's a rationale for having uh, non-expiring and non-revocable certificates. And it was a conscious decision uh, to do this. And the main reason is that there is no good method for updating a certificate once the device has been deployed to the field. Uh, remember that devices uh, were designed for in-home use and in, in, in some cases um, there is no access to the internet in order to obtain uh, revocation status. So the idea is that um, the, this has to operate whether or not there is a external uh, uh, revocation server and has to be able to operate uh, in light of the uh, has to be able to operate because there's no good method for revoking a certificate. Um, some other aspects of certificates is that uh, there is one and only one type of device certificate. Um, there aren't uh, distinctions made between clients and server certs. Uh, there's only one device certificate that serves both clients and servers. As I mentioned before, access control is based on the device's certificate. Um, even though there are no mechanisms for supporting CRL and OCSP, servers are still free to implement their own whitelists and blacklists in order to uh, add more security to their systems. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, th uh, that uh, there's uh, the certificates cannot be revoked. There's currently active uh, work in order to uh, uh, allow for uh, a system that allows revocation. So a system that allows both identity that doesn't expire and uh, authorization that doesn't expire. So this is a topic that is active in the 23 out of 5 work groups currently. Um, the 23 out of 5 uses a typical PKI architecture. Uh, there's a central root authority um, that can also authorize uh, intermediate CAs to issue uh, device certificates. And uh, the, speci the specification allows for a 2D uh, intermediate uh, certificate authority. So you, so you could have a situation where the root certificate authority directly issues certificates or the root certificate authority uh, allows intermediate CAs to issue certificates. So this is very, very standard, uh, nothing controversial on this slide. So that uh, basically um, summarizes the protocol and the security aspects of the protocol. I'd like to conclude with a section describing some of the use cases of the protocol. And the first use case of the, is the electric vehicle charging use case. Um, uh, Key2, my company, is involved in many different uh, electric vehicle charging pilots. We have a program uh, with uh, Southern Cal Edison. Um, and in this program, uh, it's based on uh, collecting data, you know, uh, measuring uh, when people typically charge and how they charge, how often they charge, and also to send uh, the demand response controls uh, in order to uh, reduce charging in certain, uh, uh, under certain conditions. This was targeted for the workplace and multi-dwelling units. 
Um, and the picture on the right is a site that is a part of this program. Um, the next uh, program, we also have a program with PG&E doing similar things in Northern California. Uh, we also have a program uh, with UC Berkeley um, that's, uh, that's used for optimizing charging uh, based on pricing. Um, and that is taking place in UC Berkeley, UCSD, and some uh, workplace environments. One of the programs I want to focus on specifically is the Optimize EV Charging Program. Uh, uh, what is Optimize EV? It is a pilot program run by the NYSEG, which stands for the New York State Electric and Gas Company. It's a utility in upstate New York. And what they want to do is learn how to make uh, electric vehicles charge better for uh, both uh, workplace and, and home users. And how it does this is that um, it dynamically schedules and reschedules electric vehicle charging based on the price of energy, the consumer preferences, the state of charge, and grid conditions. And these uh, schedule controls can happen uh, at, a, uh, minute, uh, at a one minute rate. And um, in this uh, uh, pilot, um, the, the system actually uses the DER function set instead of the flow reservation function set. So um, even though flow reservations is designed for uh, um, this type of a charging, dis dynamic charging uh, and discharging uh, uh, paradigm, uh, the DER function set can also serve this purpose and it was chosen for this purposes for uh, some technical reasons. Um, the key players for this pilot are NYSAC, the utility that is sponsoring this field trial, Cornell University, who is the technical lead for designing the optimization algorithm that is used in this uh, trial, and Key2 Systems, uh, my company who is uh, responsible for the infrastructure for implementing and controlling uh, the, the charging system. Um, this shows you some of the, uh, um, the left-hand side is the, uh, one of the marketing, marketing slides used for this program. It is an active program um, that is open to uh, people in uh, that utility uh, territory. Um, this program involves the uh, user entering uh, his charging preferences, and there's a uh, iPhone or, and web app that the user can use to specify when he wants to charge and what time he needs the vehicle by. Uh, and he enters those, pre uh, those uh, preferences and submits a charging request and the system uh, will authorize charging and send a series of controls to shape the charging over time. And this is a high level uh, diagram of the system uh, that is used to implement uh, this program. On the right hand side are the uh, smart uh, electric vehicle charging stations that can uh, receive these commands and limit the uh, level of charging to devices connected to it. Um, there's a service platform that's uh, uh, operating in the cloud um, that is used to, um, that implements the, uh, dynamically Im implements the charging algorithm and it sends a series of controls to the devices using 2030.5. And there's also a utility component uh, to this program where the utility can send uh, controls to the service platform, be it uh, using open ADR or 23.5 to send a, uh, a general control to reduce uh, all charging uh, for the entire territory over a, a certain period of time. Um, the other major use case of 23.5 is the DER use case. And uh, the use case I wanna highlight is the California Rule 21 use case. In California, uh, there's what's called Rule 21, which governs the interaction of smart inverters to the grid. And uh, Rule 21 is uh, designed to operate in three phases. Phase one is autonomous, autonomous operations. These are functions that uh, inverters must implement out of the box without uh, communications or user intervention. And these include safety related uh, functions like uh, anti-islanding, ride through controls, et cetera. Phase two uh, requires that all smart inverters be able to communicate 
using the default 2035 protocol defined by the common smart inverter profile document. Uh, phase three is the um, uh, implementation of smart inverter functions. And these functions include scheduling, reporting, uh, limiting real power, uh, and executing um, some vote var and vote var, vote what curves. Uh, phase one is in effect now. It, it was actually uh, required in 2019. Phase two is, uh, is in, in effect now. Phase three uh, devices, those functions I mentioned earlier, those devices must be able to be changeable using 2030.5 communications um, by March 22nd of 2020, which is one month from now. So in order for a, a consumer to purchase and install and operate a residential inverter starting in March 22, 2020, uh, uh, the, that inverter will have to be able to uh, comply with the communications and advanced inverter functions that are defined uh, that I described earlier. This is just basically an architecture of uh, the Rule 21 uh, program. Um, basically, all devices must be able to communicate with the utility server using 2030.5. And those devices uh, can either directly connect to the, to the utility using option one, or use a site gateway or EMS using option two, or use a uh, cloud aggregator uh, that can control devices over a wider territory using option three. Uh, some final thoughts. Um, I think that uh, electric vehicle charging and V2G are going to converge. There's a lot of work in the DER space regarding V2G and V1G, and that's that work is uh, starting to uh, uh, become more and more uh, prevalent, uh, especially with Rule 21. Uh, that's going to uh, applying to uh, storage systems in, in the future, not just battery systems. And so there's currently a lot of uh, standards work and activity to address the V2G and, D, and the convergence of D, uh, DER and EV uh, going on. Um, there's the CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission uh, V2G workshops. There's uh, activity going on in the standards uh, in the um, SAE, which is the um, essentially uh, standards organization for automotive uh, players in the US. And then there's uh, EPRI uh, work. EPRI is the uh, research arm of the utilities in the US uh, for uh, EVSE qualifications in light of uh, V2G and V1G operations in the future. So that concludes my uh, formal presentations. Uh, I think I'm open to now to uh, the Q&A part of the uh, webinar. So uh, any questions for me? Many thanks, Gordon, for sharing with us um, all this information on your work. Uh, I'll start with one question. Uh, you showed the diagram uh, where we, we have seen an electric vehicle connected to electric vehicle charger and then the charger connected to a back end system. And I've noticed on the diagram that there was, yes, this, um, maybe not, yes, this one. So there is IEEE uh, 2030.5 and OCPB, and then between the car and the charger, there is IEEE 2030.5 and ISO 1511A. Do you, do you mean we need to implement both these protocols on the charger and the car and the back end, or can we, we implement one of these protocols and get the same functionality? Well, I, I think it depends on what you, you're going to use the protocols for. The low level uh, signaling between the EV and EVSC, I think 15118 is more designed to handle that. And the specific use case of like uh, commercial charging, I think OCPP is more geared to handle those type of applications. 23.5 is more geared for like V2G type op operations um, that I guess you can sort of implement in 15118, but it's more efficient to implement it in uh, 2030.5. So I see uh, with 23.5, it may coexist in uh, with other protocols. 
Um, it's not meant to directly replace those protocols. It's meant to more efficiently transfer um, B to G type controls and information between uh, devices uh, uh, using that protocol. Can you define what you mean by more efficiently? If we can take, for example, the case of comparison between IEEE 2030.5 and ISO 15.11.8. Yeah, I think um, uh, 15.11, well, IEEE 23.5 is, uh, can convey information like the schedule of when to charge a vehicle uh, securely. So it's equipped to do that. I think 15.118 also addresses some other more uh, EV to EV SE uh, centric uh, lower level controls that maybe 23.5 is not equipped to handle. So 23.5 can handle the higher level controls if all you're trying to do is uh, schedule a charge at a certain time using a certain energy level, 23.5 is well equipped to do that. But if you need more finer controls, especially for the DC charging case, um, then 23.5 is not uh, really designed for that. I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. We had a previous uh, webinar where uh, we discussed ISO 15.11.8 and which it can handle both low level communication and high level communication, including with the new version of V2G. Now I'm taking here the, um, I'm not taking sides, I'm taking the point of view of a car company, for example, that comes to me sometimes and asks, why should I implement ISO 15.11.8 or why should I implement IEEE 2030.5? Um, because obviously from their point of view, they, they want to avoid to implement more than one protocol. Do we leave it to uh, a future where we let the market choose and uh, risk maybe disintegration of the market where you have certain charging points implementing one protocol and the other, another protocol? Yeah, I think we probably want to avoid that. Um, speaking with uh, 23.5 uh, versus 15.118, 15.118 only governs the communications between um, the vehicle and the charger. Um, it theoretically supports, you know, using third party or different protocols to go beyond the um, EVSC itself, but 15.118 isn't designed to go outside of the uh, EVSE. Whereas 23.5 protocol uh, can exist in the electric vehicle, it exists in the electric vehicle charger, it exists in the cloud, and exists all the way to the back backend um, utility server. So it, in that sense, um, you can make a complete end-to-end -end connection between a electric vehicle and the utility Excel, utility server itself um, using 23.5, you don't need any other protocols in order to traverse from one end to the other end. Whereas I, I believe all the other protocols you specified can't do that on its own. You need to do it in combination with other protocols. For example, 15.18 plus OCPP plus open ADR in order to get the same functionality that you can with 23.5 end to end. Okay, uh, I'll take a bit uh, some of the questions from the group chat. Um, there is a question on has IEEE 2030.5 applied anywhere outside the US so far for EV charging or any other use case? Yeah, I think 2035 is just getting started and I believe there's work in Canada and in Australia that is starting to use 2035 for various services. Um, again, um, er all of these are pretty much in, in the pilot phase or field trial phase. I think the US is more advanced in that it is probably uh, almost in production phase. Um, other uh, territories um, are a little bit further behind, uh, but uh, there is a lot of momentum uh, moving forward using 23.5. Do you see any problems with the issue of uh... Uh, unable to control real time. So in the UK, some services you need a, a second response. And I think you mentioned during your talk that it's at least a minute. Um, I think uh, typically I would recommend operation on a minute time frame. but for, uh, for uh, some of the use cases, some of the use cases with uh, Southern Cal Edison, they're scheduling controls on the you know, 15 second boundaries. So it is possible to push the protocol all the way down to the seconds range, but it is not possible to push the protocol all the way down to the sub-second 
range. So if you're expecting to control sub-second uh, uh, accuracy, um, uh, this is not the protocol to use. But if your use case is on the order of seconds to minutes or larger, then yes, you can use this protocol. Do you get information on the energy from the battery or state of charge? Yes, you can. Um, there is um, a resource under DER called Dur Availability, and the battery system or or the vehicle can report its current state of charge. It could report the amount of uh, energy that is available, uh, et cetera. So yes, there is battery status information. So in, in the UK, we don't have this information. This is very hard information to get from the car. Can you explain to me, please, again, how can you get this information? In the oh, 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 I see. I, I, I thought you meant, does the protocol support that information? And the protocol does support that information. But yes, you are correct that a lot of the uh, car manufacturers do not make it very easy for uh, you to access that information. And so there's no real direct way for you know, to get that information uh, automatically. In the optimized EV trial, the user would basically uh, read the state of charge from like a, uh, an app or a display in the car and enter it into uh, our app manually in order for us to know what the state of rough state of charge is. So- Do you uh, worry about erroneous entry or missing data? Um, it is a concern that because if you enter or misenter the data, then your your charging profile uh, may be incorrect. Um, but I think there are you know, safeguards in order to uh, in the optimized uh, EV algorithm to try to compensate to see if uh, that uh, request makes sense or not, and and to provide uh, and to do some checks based on that. But yeah. Um, I, I don't think we can do anything about, you know, if the person enters in, like, uh, uh, he needs, his state of charge is 5% instead of 50%. Um, that yeah. is a concern. That's it. Do you have conversations with the car manufacturers on the importance of this information? Do you think we, they could be providing this information? Yes, I think we are definitely having uh, conversations with car manufacturers. And this is in the U.S., right? Particularly in the U.S., correct. Uh, a lot of times, um, car manufacturers have their own uh, system. Um, you know, G has their uh, Global Star, so they have their own method of uh, communicating to their devices, their own proprietary method. Um, and I think uh, we're talking with vehicle manufacturers in order to be able to access their system in order to get information uh, from our Convoy platform. So our cloud-based platform would talk to the vehicle manufacturer's cloud-based manu uh, platform in order to get uh, status information from individual vehicles through that method. Instead of directly uh, through the vehicle to the EVSC to the cloud, we have a direct link from our cloud platform to the car manufacturer's cloud platform to get that information. To, to, so the, to get, to make sure I got that correct, you're not relying on the link between the car and the charger to get the battery information. You're relying more on the, your cloud versus connecting, for example, to the cloud of the car company where this data is, is available. Yes, that is one method. In the optimized EV method, uh, we couldn't do that because uh, it wasn't, uh, it was uh, anyone who has any type of electric vehicle can use this service. And so the only way we have to enter in that information for that pilot is through uh, the user entering it into a, an application. But uh, looking forward, we do see that we will get information from the uh, vehicle manufacturer's telematic system uh, from a cloud to cloud uh, basis instead of through the uh, vehicle itself. From the vehicle itself. And right. do you, is is uh, is IEEE 2030.5 implemented on any cars already in the U.S.? Uh, I, I all I can say is that we have an agreement with a very large car manufacturer in the U.S. and they've licensed our 23.5. So it's not commercially deployed, but it is um, uh, being uh, actively looked at and and considered.
And how, how easy to implement it in the car? Are, how, how, does it, how much does it cost if this is not commercially sensitive, or maybe in percentages, to know how realistically it is to expect a manufacturer, for example, to implement IEEE 2030.5 in California versus having to do ISO 151118 in, in, in Europe, for example? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the, the work that uh, is being done using 23F5 is to is that um, a lot of the electric vehicle manufacturers may have to comply with like California Rule 21 um, for their uh, electric vehicles because electric vehicle look, looks like a, a large mobile battery and it will come under the uh, Rule 21 rules. And so the vehicle manufacturers are, are going to use 23 out of 5 in order to uh, receive like volt, volt bar, volt watt, grid stability signals from the utilities that they are currently you know, charging from in order to satisfy the California requirements. And uh, what's done in California is usually adopted uh, by the rest of the United States. And so the vehicle manufacturers are looking at using 23.5 for that aspect of communications, the uh, good reliability uh, requirements for electric vehicles that okay. are coming in the future. And, yeah. and then if they want to do, for example, plug and charge, they would have, have to also implement ISO 1508. Uh, possibly, yes. Okay. Um, and did you, I don't know if you can share that, but like how, long, how, how easy it is to implement it? How much, does, how much cost does it add to implement this in the car and in the, in the, in the charge? Well, I think it, it was designed to be very easy to implement. Like I mentioned, you know, this looks like a, uh, uh, the protocol or use of the protocol looks like an interaction between a web server uh, and a web browser. So all the tools that uh, someone uses these days to create like a web app, um, they can use to implement this protocol. So I think the protocol itself is very, very easy uh, to implement. It uses, it, it doesn't invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel. It doesn't use any proprietary, you know, components. It uses off-the-shelf components that a lot of people can easily uh, essentially bolt together and, and uh, be able to support the protocol. Okay. Um, in the UK, we're working on um, smart charging regulation where uh, the priority is for uh, standards and open communication protocols. Uh, but the government, I don't think they're planning to specify one protocol over another. They're leaving it to the market, most likely. Um, this is my interpretation of things. How did you manage in California to get I, IEEE 2030.5 to be a requirement and a rule? Well, there, in, in 20, well, in California, they had specific functions that they need all inverters to implement. Um, those are the ones I had listed, volt var, volt watt, controlling the power factor. Those are um, controls that are directly supported by the 23.5 protocol. And as far as I know, uh, not really supported by any other protocol like open ADR or something along those lines. And it was designed for uh, distributed uh, um, uh, devices. Um, so it's not like a SCADA system where the utility can can have a direct connection to each and every one of those devices. Has to, the protocol has to work over the web and it has to be able to support those specific functions that California required. And the only protocol that met California's needs was 23.5. And so in order to promote you know, wide adoption and interoperability, um, 23.5 became the specified standard because it, it met all the requirements. It was the one and only protocol that they found that met all their requirements for, you know, essentially uh, deployment today. Got it. Um, you mentioned an optimization algorithm on your uh, service platform. How fast does it run? The um, yeah, like I, I mentioned, it makes calculations and sends controls every minute. So when the vehicle is charging, it'll get updates uh, on its uh, charging um, uh, every minute. And, uh, and then the information from the distribution network, how do you get it? Like the state of the network? Um, this is communication communicated from the uh, utility. Um, I think that goes into the, the, like, the DERMS part of the utility that's, uh, that's listed on the uh, 
on the left hand side. Um, so there is communications with the utility in order to get uh, that type of information. But it's also based on historical you know, usage patterns. Yeah. So it's, it's more based on historical usage patterns um, and, and prediction than on the current uh, state of the, uh, the grid. I, I think um, the state of the grid only applies on like, like very, very, very hot days where, where, um, where they may want to send a generalized control to make everyone reduce you know, energy usage. But for the typical operation, um, the utility part, uh, the grid um, information uh, itself isn't uh, as important as what the historical usage pattern is, like most people charge uh, as soon as they come home from work. And so they're already expecting that there, there'll be, uh, they'll need to spread out the charging over a certain time period. And based on who else is connecting to that particular you know, circuit in the grid, and they will uh, 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 allocate charging based on that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned an APRI working group. Can you mention uh, can you can you mention what that is again? And meanwhile, I'm going to paste the question from someone that I did not understand, but maybe you can read it and you understand it. Yeah, the EPRI Working Group. Uh, EPRI stands for Electric Power Research Institute. Yeah, it's, no, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a working group in order to try to standardize uh, uh, what a smart communicating uh, uh, EVSE you know should should have. So right now. Um, there are many, many different manufacturers of, of uh, electric vehicle charging stations with a very vastly different capabilities as far as their ability to like measure, you know, accurately measure how much uh, uh, power is being used, uh, what communications protocols they use, how much, what level of control they have on to limit the maximum uh, a level of uh, the vehicle charging. And so I think um, the EPRI work group is trying to standardize on a minimum set of requirements that all electric vehicle service equipment must meet uh, to meet uh, some of the demands in the future. And then it's up to uh, like when you say uh, EPRI, so it's kind of a publicly accessible specification where a manufacturer could take yes. it into account. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Uh, so that I, work group has, has just started. So uh, if people want to participate in this work group, I think there's still opportunity to, to do so. So. And how um, do people get information on that? Uh, I, I, I can send you a link. Um, the, the person at EPRI who's managing it is uh, John Hallowell. So I'll send you a, uh, uh, his email and you can uh, 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 contact him for uh, information on how to uh, participate. Is he, in the if he's okay to share his information, are you able to add it on the slide so that everyone can have access to if they wanted to contact him? Uh, sure. I, I think it's an open uh, work group that... Uh, we, I mean, we can wait. Uh, I mean, you can check if you, if, to make sure you're happy to share this information or not. If that's sure. the, an updated version of the slides to to include how people can contact that working group if they want to be involved. Yes, I will do that. There is a question on the chat. If you could read it, please. Okay, let me see if I can find the chat. So the first three questions were along the lines, why IEEE 2030.5 and not the other protocols that can do the same functionalities? And I think we covered that. And then the last one. Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, the question is, since energy storage case is general, is it correct that power flow P and Q levels can be controlled by the inverter, whether on the EV or off the EV? In other words, the flow control method is not required to set power level trans uh, power transfer levels, correct? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if I, I'm going to be answering this question um, perfectly, but in general, the DER function set supports both P, real power, and Q, reactive power control. 
uh, both charging and discharging, um, both injecting and absorbing a reactive power. So the utility can send those controls to uh, a battery system that can support that. And a battery system can, can, can be an electric vehicle's battery. I think currently um, most uh, electric vehicle systems are, you know, consume uh, energy, they, they charge. In the future, they will be able to help support the grid by also discharging. Um, in theory, they may also be able to provide reactive power uh, uh, controls with uh, a plus or minus uh, uh, Q level support. But right now, I don't know of any uh, vehicle that supports reactive power controls, but in theory, it can be done and the protocol can support that. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question from me. Uh, where can people find more information on the rest of the function sets and on the protocol in general? Um, the protocol itself is an IEEE protocol, so you could um, purchase the uh, protocol documents directly from the IEEE website. Um, so it is not like free in, in a sense that you can just download a copy for free, but it is available uh, by uh, purchasing it from the IEEE uh, website. Okay, uh, thank you. Any ending thoughts from your part? I think uh, what I see going forward is the convergence of uh, EV and D DER. And so I think some of the protocols that were originally designed to handle one case or the other uh, are gonna converge. And uh, the utilities and stakeholders uh, at that point are looking to standardize on one protocol to do everything instead of having to support multiple protocols. And I see that happening uh, more and more, and, and it's gonna be accelerating more and more. I think 23.5 is a general enough, general enough protocol that supports many different use cases to serve uh, that type of, uh, you know, one protocol to serve all use cases. I think I should, you're now giving me an idea. I think I should organize a debate between the different uh, uh, leading experts on the protocols and, and get them to answer these questions would you be up for it um uh i guess i me or someone else on in, in our company can't do that but i think a protocol comparison has actually been done a by... debate, rather rather like a debate like you'd say this protocol is more efficient than the other and we can have a, a an inf where we're arguing where we're put, uh, comparing right. rather than like it's nothing negative it's more than sure Sure, I think something along those lines has already been done by right, okay. uh, one of the working groups in uh, the CPUC. They defined a set of use cases and a set of protocols, and they had presentations from uh, representatives of each of those protocols, and they created a, uh, uh, a spreadsheet and a final report, which I think is publicly available, and I, I, I'll, I'll search not, and find. Please do, and, because it's not always easy for me, for me for some reason to access the CPUC website. Yeah, I, I could send that a copy of that to you. Uh, basically, yeah. they, they did a lot of work on comparing, uh, uh, they had uh, certain defined use cases and they compared which protocols could, uh, was able to serve those use cases. And so there's a comprehensive spreadsheet with uh, different types of uh, uh, capabilities and check boxes whether or not you know this protocol can do it or or you need this protocol in conjunction with another protocol to implement the function so it was quite uh, comprehensive and it, uh, it uh, addressed uh, der use cases um, charging dc charging ac charging so I v think to g v to g exactly so i think that would be a very useful for you and the other members uh, of this webinar to review good great gordon thank you so much for your time and for sharing all this information all right thank you very much and i will send you those uh, information those links to the epri uh working group and uh the cpuc report uh in a subsequent email thank you bye Thank you, everybody.